So just to start off, I'd like to get your reaction to Senator McConnell um, stepping down from leadership. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I wish him well. Um, and it was uh, quite an emotional speech that he uh, presented. Um, but, I, I, you know, what I hope uh, for the country is that his successor in leadership is somebody who's um, committed to work on a bipartisan basis. As we know how the Senate works, we have to work on a bipartisan basis to get things done. And that's what I hope. Uh, uh, the succession of leadership in the Republican caucus in the Senate, uh, uh, you know, that's what I hope they embody. I was surprised he, you know, I wasn't aware of it. Um, I thought he gave a very gracious, very heartfelt speech. Um, you know, I often say, you know, being major majority or minority leader, I don't envy the person's task. You're trying to herd cats. Uh, I'm sure the loss of his sister-in-law, you know, had an impact. Sounds like he already made that decision. This is just kind of the time to announce it. Now, I personally appreciate, uh, you know, for example, his supreme mom moment of leadership where after the tragic death of uh, Justice Scalia, he said, let's let the American people decide the direction of the court. That was the right decision, uh, and that was a good call on his part. Um, and I appreciate the fact that he's announced it er you know, early enough to give our conference time to, to really, really focus on, okay, what, what should our mission be? Uh, we're elected re representatives of Republicans. Uh, somebody's got to push back on the radical left policies and ideologies of destroying this country. And, and we've got to develop a mission statement to state that, develop goals, and then find leaders that embrace that mission and can you know, lead in a more collaborative process. So he's given us time to, to sort that out. So we're not in a rush process right now. Yeah, well, first let me just talk about the legislative branch. Um, after many, many weeks of hard work in the Senate, we came up with a very strong uh, proposal to bring order uh, to the southern border and uh, deal with a number of uh, very critical issues, uh, not just the immigration, but also uh, the importation of uh, deadly fentanyl and other uh, drugs that are being brought in by Mexican cartels. And uh, it was so disappointing uh, to see uh, the Republicans, um, you know, turn and, and, uh, and say they no longer wanted to make that a part of our national security bill. Um, so I, I hope that the president highlights how the tools that were in that measure would have helped to bring order and security to our southern border. I hope he emphasizes that uh, significantly while he's there. There's always questions about how much authority the president has to do things on his own without uh, authorization from Congress, but I think we would have made it absolutely clear that we are committed to a secure and orderly border uh, if we had have, uh, gotten Republican cooperation in passing that bill. President Biden is heading to the border tomorrow. What do you make of the timing of this visit? Well, he's, he's desperate. He's finally feeling the public pressure. You know, unfortunately, many in the mainstream media have not covered the border until Mayor Adams and Mayor Johnson uh, started realizing that the sanctuary cities that they've been running are going to be overrun by this, by just a fraction of the people that President Biden and his Democrat colleagues in, in the Congress have, have allowed through their open border policy. So now they're getting the public pressure, what, which is what it's going to take to get President Biden to use the executive authority he has to secure the border. Understand, President Trump under existing law secured the border. Now, he could have had stronger authority because of some court decisions, but Democrats wouldn't give it to him. But President Biden using that same executive authority opened the border up. So he's got the authority to close it. If he needs stronger authority, we're happy to give it to him. What we didn't need was an immigration bill that codified an awful lot of his open border policy. So anyway, he's desperate. He's under, coming under political pressure. That's a good thing. Maybe he'll feel enough pressure to actually use that authority to secure the border and protect Americans as his first responsibility. Do you have any faith that a border bill can make it through this year through Congress? If we would use the leverage properly, we could have. You know, unfortunately, 
we frittered away that possibility over the last couple months. Uh, now the House, and I really appreciate Speaker Johnson, you know, one out of five leaders in the White House stood up for the American public and said, no, we need to secure the border first. And uh, he was under a great deal of pressure, I hear. So I appreciate that he stood fast, but the other four, they put Ukraine first. That tells you something. So if the Speaker stands strong, if the House Republicans stand strong, we just still might be able to use the President's desire for Ukraine funding to force him to use that authority to secure the border. In terms of a border bill being passed by the Senate, you found out how unserious Democrats in the Senate are. They were just looking for political cover. They weren't looking for a border bill. They wanted immigration reform. They wanted to codify an awful lot of President Biden's open border, which is why that bill died of its own weight. Uh, within 24 hours of being introduced. Yesterday, the president held a meeting about the budget and the yes. potential for another government shutdown. Um, Speaker Johnson has since floated the idea of a short-term bill to cut things maybe a week or two. Um, how confident are you that the government will be? Well, coming out of that meeting uh, at the White House, uh, I felt that uh, the participants were sounding a note of optimism that we'll be able to keep the government open while the final remaining issues of the 12 appropriations bills that fund the various agencies of government are, uh, are resolved. I think they are very, very close, very, very close to resolving all the outstanding issues. And so hopefully that last uh, a couple of weeks will allow that all to come together. Um, it's disappointing that uh, knowing that we were facing this deadline at the end of the week for uh, four of the appropriations bills um, that we weren't ready uh, to go forward, but uh, I, 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 feel, um, I feel optimistic that we can avoid a government shutdown. Really a lot of it is on Speaker Johnson's shoulders uh, to figure out, uh, it, it, um, you know, how to persuade his caucus uh, to uh, continue and avoid a shutdown. So since yesterday's meeting, Speaker Johnson has floated the idea of a short-term bill to, you know, um, punt the deadlines for a government shutdown. How confident are you in that process? And do you think there's well, going to continue to see Listen, I, I'm the guy that uh, shepherded through the Preventing Government Shutdown Act and then put pressure on it to literally become the, the Republican conference position during the last shutdown talks in October. So I'm opposed to shutdowns, and I'm, I'm okay with short-term CRs to prevent that. So I obviously would support a short-term CR to give, I guess, the appropriator, appropriators time to negotiate some more things. But personally, I think the, the least worst solution right now is just do a full-year CR that will produce automatic cuts, which are a good thing. Uh, it's also going to prevent a bunch of port barrel spending earmarks which are the gateway drug to massive deficit spending. So I can see a lot of value in just a one-year CR plus. It would end the 2024 cycle. We're halfway into the year now. We need to move on to the fiscal year 2025 budgeting appropriation process. So we, the more we drag this out, the less time we're going to have for a functioning fiscal year 2025 process. We'll be back in the same boat next year. We can't let that happen. So better to end this process now, full year CR, and turn to fiscal year 2025 and bring a little more function to that process. So I spoke to Senator um, Cabot's this morning. Yes. She's obviously on appropriations with you. And um, she's my ranking on Labor H. Yes. yes. So she expressed frustration with this whole yeah. process. Do you share that? Absolutely. You know, I, 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 I want to tout the uh, responsibility of the Senate this cycle. Um, at the very beginning of last year, um, our new chair and ranking member said, we're going to get this, our job done on time. And we processed all of our bills. All of them came out of the Appropriations Committee on widely bipartisan votes. Uh, the bill that uh, Senator Capito and I put together came out on a 24 to 2 vote. Um, that's bipartisan work, and that's what we have to do to responsibly fund uh, the government. Um, we're very disappointed with the chaos in the House and their inability to process bills. Can you talk a little bit more about the Access to Family Building Act, and are you confident that this will get passed? Um, so we saw the Alabama Supreme Court uh, last week uh, equate a, a, a IVF, in vitro fertilization, um, and 
frozen embryos with full personhood. Um, the, when the Dobbs decision came down overturning Roe versus Wade, uh, a lot of us sounded an alarm bell, bell saying it's not just, if it weren't enough that half of America has fewer rights than their parents and grandparents, they're going after other things. They're going after contraception, after mifepristone, they're going after um, marriage rights, they're going after all sorts of other things. And this is just a proof point of how uh, extensive um, uh, their uh, um, interest in taking away rights and freedoms. Um, it's so powerful that this measure is led by Tammy Duckworth, who uh, needed IVF in order to build her family with her husband. Um, this is the story and the promise for so many other families. Um, and to have that threatened uh, should be in intolerable to everyone. The meeting Friday with several U.S. Coast Guard officials and yes. business leaders um, in the um, ice breaking capacity on the yes. Great Lakes. So how important is this bill to the Great Lakes um, and the residents of Northeast uh, Wisconsin? Yes. Well, it might have been a mild winter this winter in Wisconsin, but there have been many instances where uh, the Coast Guard has had insufficient ice breaking capacity in order to keep commerce going on our Great Lakes. When that happens, we have seen things like entire uh, auto lines be uh, closed down because they weren't getting the supplies and inputs they needed in a timely basis. We've seen ripple effects through the economy that cost billions. And so uh, having the ice breaking capacity to make sure that maritime commerce can continue as long as possible in the winter in the Great Lakes is critically important. And we've underinvested. There's only one large scale icebreaker that the Coast Guard maintains in the Great Lakes, only one. There's some smaller ones. Um, but if you look at uh, ice breaking capacity, um, uh, you know, by Canada, they've invested a lot more. Uh, and so we really have to keep up. Our uh, economy depends on it. On Monday, you held a roundtable discussion on the federal health agencies and COVID. How did that go? Um, and what do you see happening next? Well, I thought it went, went very well. Uh, we had a panel of experts from around the world. Uh, we were able to get all kinds of facts on the table, indisputable, uh, proving how our federal health agencies have lied to the American public repeatedly, have been opaque, have not been transparent, are covering things up, are hiding information from, from the American public, and the American public deserves to know these things. So I, I thought it was excellent. Um, just by the reaction of the you know, s small bites of video that are being viewed uh, well over a million times. Pe people want this information. So I, I was happy to facilitate uh, uh, giving these dissident voices. Pe people have a different perspective, that, that have a second opinion, which as, as long as I've been alive, that's always been a tenet of medicine. If you've got a serious condition, well, get a second, maybe even a third opinion. That hasn't been allowed by the pandemic. I've tried to provide platform for second and third opinions. Those people, unfortunately, must be blind and deaf. There is a mountain of evidence. Sen Senator Grassley and I provided all the evidence anybody would need if, they, if it would have been covered in the media to say, you know, we probably shouldn't elect this guy. It looks like he comes from a pretty corrupt crime family, peddling influence, selling his name, selling access to him. And as president, he'd probably be highly compromised. I mean, we presented that evidence in September 2020. Unfortunately, the media didn't cover that. Now the House has just provided more and more detail, putting in pieces of the puzzle. It's obvious that President Biden and Hunter Biden and James Biden, these are, these are corrupt individuals. They shouldn't even be anywhere near political power in, in, in the United States.